Hi, I'm Jack Cotterell. And I'm Aaron Parnas. And this is Zoomed In. On this week's episode of Zoomed In, Aaron and I start off by hitting the headlines, talking about President Zelensky's address to Congress and breaking down some of the debates around a possible no-fly zone in Ukraine. After that, Aaron and I finish up, as we always do, with tweets of the week. So Aaron, ready to zoom in? Jack, I, I'm ready, and we have a lot to talk about, uh, really just about one subject, and that's the subject that everyone's been talking about lately, and that is the, Ru- the illegal Russian invasion and occupation of Ukraine. Um, and this week, I mean, we're now 21 days, a little over three well, three weeks as we're recording, but by the time this is going to be up, it's going to be a little over 21 days uh, since the invasion began. And the big headlines thus far is that Russia has failed. I mean, Russia, no matter how you look at it, is not going to win this war, even if it is successful in taking the major cities and overthrowing the Ukrainian government, which I do think eventually it will be successful if a peace nego- if a peace agreement isn't reached. I do think Russia will be able to achieve its objectives, quote unquote, but it's already failed in a number of ways. First, president, or rather dictator Vladimir Putin, uh, when he first or a while back said that he could take Ukraine within 11 minutes. He also said he could take Ukraine within three hours or rather the capital. It's now been 21 days. Uh, U.S. intelligence and Western intelligence believe that Vladimir Putin could take Ukraine within 72 hours. Once again, it's been 21 days. And Russia has not been successful in taking key of the capital, Kharkiv, which is the second largest city, or other towns along the southern part of Ukraine. I mean, it's been successful in taking one large town, the town of Kherson, and, the t- and um, it has besieged Mariupol, which we've seen terrible images coming out of there regarding the bombing of a theater, um, even though the the, those at the theater uh, warned Russia that there were children and civilians in there, the bombing of, and, and just besieging the entire town, um, there are mass casualties in that town. So um, other than that, Russia arguably has not been successful. And there are several reasons why. One, Russian morale is extremely low. Uh, mm-hmm. they, Russian soldiers don't know what they're fighting for. They're fighting against their own brothers, their own sisters in Ukraine, many of whom um, they, grew up, they grew up in, they grew up with, they... Uh, speak the same language with, I mean, there's so many, so many reasons. And um, it's, that's number one. And then number two is the fact that uh, Ukraine is just putting up a significant resistance, both in the military forces put up, but also Russian forces are not trained to go through the terrain that is Ukraine. Ukraine is Mm -hmm. a very rugged terrain, lots of forests, lots of hills, lots of mountains. um, And Russia is just not prepared. That's why Russia is going right now and looking for Syrian mercenaries, looking for um, any mercenary from like Kazakhstan, for example. They're just looking for anyone or anything to help fight. That's not the tell of a winning country. Mm. And and especially, you know, we've seen the banning of independent, you know, journals or independent reports, uh, the banning and changing of Russian state TV. Uh, you can no longer access what is it, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and, and maybe TikTok as well, or is TikTok still up in Russia? So it's a little, um, there have been conflicting reports. TikTok itself, the app is working, I believe, but no one's allowed, if you're in Russia, you're not allowed to post uh, mm-hmm. or uh, message back and forth, but you can still scroll on your For You page, I believe, um, but that might be incorrect. So yeah, and, and, you know, blocking information, as you said, that's not the sign that you're winning. You're not being very successful if you have to root out any criticism of your, but at this point, what you've described is a failed operation. Yeah. And, and so let's talk a little bit more about, so President Zelensky, it would have been, by the time you're listening to this, yesterday uh, had his address to what was the full chamber of, of Congress. Um, some standouts in his speech were, uh, in the congressional side, at least, we saw Joe Manchin scrolling on his iPad a little bit. Um, and notably, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who refused to clap for President Zelensky the entire time and has now uh, come out with what she called a statement to the nation, which I don't really think it's to the nation because not, uh, not most of us don't want to be listening to Marjorie Taylor Greene saying that she does not support aid to Ukraine. Now, of course, this is a part of her America First initiative. Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, is what many have called the um, you know, helpful idiots. I think it was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman who said that uh, to Putin's, you know, Putin's attempt at taking Ukraine. She has been in her uh, ignorance pro-Putin, and you know, even I think she's done it intentionally, been pro-Putin. But what are your some of your takeaways uh, besides 
Marjorie Taylor Greene being terrible. What were some of your takeaways from the speech? I mean, at first, I thought it was a fantastic speech. I think that Absolutely. he is a hero um, and he needs to be recognized as such. I will say this, though, that every time we see him speak live like we did, it may be the last time we'll ever see him speak live again. And people need to recognize that he is living in a war-torn country, a country that is currently a town, Kiev, that is currently under significant bombardment every single night. Um, and President Zelensky isn't wrong when he says that the last time that when he speaks to people, that it may be the last time they see him alive, because the ultimate goal of the Russian government is to either capture or kill President Zelensky. Um, realistically, do I think it could happen? It definitely could happen. I mean, you can't put that past them. Um, so I, I think that's a major takeaway that he's still doing this despite those threats. Also, I think a, a significant takeaway, which not many people have actually spoken about, is the fact that Zelensky has sort of given up on the no-fly zone. Um, initially, he was saying no-fly zone or bust. And today he re reiterated the need for a no-fly zone in Ukraine, but he did give the United States an alternative. Um, and the alternative is to provide air defense systems to Ukraine so that Ukraine can impose their own no-fly zone. Now, I personally do not support a no-fly zone in Ukraine imposed by the United States or NATO because I think that will draw us into a more into a longer, more protracted conflict. But I do support giving air defense systems and Javelin missiles and MIG-29 fighter jets uh, to Ukraine in order to uh, for them to achieve their own air superiority, protect their skies. Because if they don't, the Russian military, the Russian military, their air force, uh, could easily take over and win this war if it wanted to. It surprisingly hasn't yet, um, but it could. It has the capability. So that's why closing the sky is crucial. And that's why President Zelensky has been calling on it. Um, and yeah, I mean, unfortunately, you have your members of Congress who didn't vote for aid to Ukraine. And unfortunately, it's been on both sides. You had members like Cori Bush on the left, mm -hmm. and you had members like Marjorie Taylor Greene on the right. But I, I'm, I'm comforted in the fact, a, but very different reasons, first off. I mean, Cori yeah. Bush is not voting against aid because she's America first, like Marjorie Taylor Greene. It's different reasons, but whatever the reason is, um, I'm comforted in the fact that the majority, 98, 99% of Congress um, mm. voted in favor of it and supports Ukraine wholeheartedly. Yeah, and what do you see the, the next steps of uh, if any sort of US involvement um, in this conflict being, and, and what's gonna be the direction uh, that Congress is taking? You know, we saw, um, pretty uh, and impactful, and I'd say maybe even some surprising uh, banning of Russian oil, uh, gas, energy. I mean, that was a tremendous move uh, for President Biden to, to, uh, to endorse and to support the sanction that many believe wouldn't come and probably the strongest of them all. But what is the, in, in terms of potential economic warfare or, you know, any other type of aid to Ukraine, what do, you, what do you see are the next steps, if any, for the U.S. Congress? Yeah, so I mean, the next steps is they're going to continue, continue just providing economic support. Um, they just, President Biden just sent $800 billion today, um, including brand new drones, high-tech drones that he's sending over to Ukraine. And I think that's what you're going to see. You're going to see increased sanctions on one end. Um, I'm not sure who else they can sanction or what else they can sanction, but I guess more sanctions and then more aid. That's going to be the two things until such time a NATO uh, a NATO gets involved or something is, happens with the United States troop or a United States military personnel in, in Eastern Europe. Um, and then that's what's going to, I think that's what will take for the United States to get involved into this war. Unfortunately, um, I mean, hopefully no one, no one wants that. No one wants the United States to get into a shooting match with Russia, but it's very possible. I would say it's greater than 50% chance it happens even accidentally. Um, so I guess we'll see. Um, I, I, I will say I, went, I was on a White House briefing with TikTokers the other day. And the question I asked was something very similar to Jen Psaki. And the question was, what will it take for the United States to get involved more, whether it's imposing the no-fly zone or putting actual boots on the ground? And unfortunately, the White House didn't really give a full answer. But I, I understand they, couldn't, they can't give answers because it's likely classified what the reason is. Um, but... It, it, it begs the question, will chemical weapons be the straw that breaks the camel ba camel's back? Will it be actual firing into NATO territory? Hmm. Will it be taking over Ukraine completely? What will it be? Um, and at what point do the, does the United States get involved? Um, only time will tell. And, and Aaron, before we hop into Tweets of the Week, you brought up something that I've been just dying to talk about. And, you know, you've been, you've been tweeting about it. You've been 
chick talking about it. Mm-hmm. It's a bad pun there. Um, and I'll, I think a lot of our listeners want to know it. I, I do, you know, I've just finished up a finals week. I haven't, you know, we haven't really been able to catch up. So this is our opportunity. Could you tell our listeners you know, and myself, because I'm interested more about the briefing that you attended yourself. And I believe it was 29 other um, influencers on TikTok and what it means for Gen Z to be fighting the information warfare that's going on right now. Yeah, for sure. So um, the other day, uh, 29 uh, TikTokers and myself were invited to join a White House briefing with two White House officials. It was later reported that the two White House officials were Jen Psaki and Matt Miller. Um, if the White House is watching this, I was not the one who told them that. Um, anyways, um, so uh, it, was, it was just like a regular press briefing. Uh, for the first about 20 minutes, uh, both Saki and Miller spoke about what the White House is doing to combat misinformation and what the White House is doing to stand with European allies in the Ukraine. And in the latter half, 25 minutes at the end, we were uh, the TikTokers were allowed to ask questions. Uh, about five of us were able to get in our questions before the end of time, myself included. And it was just a great experience. Um, it was just it, it was truly an opportunity for us to uh, question the White House, to us to get accurate information from the White House, see what they're doing. We weren't paid for this. We weren't told what to make content about it. We, we weren't even required to make any content. Um, unfortunately, Fox News and Laura Ingram and the far right have kind of latched onto it as though it's some kind of America propaganda effort. Um, it, it wasn't anything like that. Um, unlike the Russian government, who is paying TikTokers to make con- uh, content. Mm. That's not what the White House is doing. Um, so it was- I don't know. It, was, it looks like you got, a, you got, some, you got some new stuff in the, in the background. Is it a new cow chair? Are you sure you didn't take it? <laughs> no. Um, it, it, was, it was a great briefing. Um, and it, it, it wasn't a political briefing. A, mo- a lot of people on that call um, were just regular journalists. They weren't necessarily um, right wing or left wing. And it's important to recognize the fact that the White House is doing outreach to a whole new brand of journalists on TikTok, many of whom have a larger following and get more views per video than Fox News does in its hourly segments. So I think it's a, it's important. It's great. And it was a great briefing. I was honored to be on it. Absolutely. So it wasn't it wasn't like the SNL sketch. It was different. You know, I wish it was like the SNL sketch, but it, it wasn't like that. We were not in the Oval Office with President Biden. Unfortunately, we were on a Zoom call. No uh, Jason Derulo. No, Jason Derulo. <laughs> all right. Well, Aaron, we are all so excited for you. And that's an awesome opportunity. Well-deserved. Keep killing it on TikTok. And Gen Z is going to keep killing it, battling disinformation. That was hitting the headlines with our, I'm going to say special. I, Aaron, you might even be the guest today. we got a famous guy over here. Um, let's get tweets of the week. Let's do it. So you all know that we spend a lot of time on the Zoom Bin podcast talking to awesome, interesting, fascinating people about, you know, similarly fascinating topics. But sometimes the most interesting things are right under our noses, like how one of the oldest asset classes in history isn't on the radar of most investors. I'm referring to blue chip artwork. That's right. Blue chip works of art. The ultra wealthy have used artwork to store and grow wealth for generations. And nowadays, it seems like only the Jeff Bezoses and Beyonce's of the world can afford a Picasso. But that's no longer the case with Masterworks. They're the startup democratizing the art market, giving everyday investors a piece of the art pie or palette, to be metaphorical. And you know, Jack, their solution is to make blue chip art investable because contemporary artwork has a low correlation to public equities. Art pieces actually outpace the S&P 500 from 1995 to 2021. And now anyone can add paintings by artists like Monet and Banksy to their portfolio without paying millions. So you can see why demand for Masterworks has been through the roof. And they've already signed up almost 300,000 investors. Our listeners actually receive priority access to their latest offerings at masterworks.art backslash zoomed in. Just go to masterworks.art backslash zoomed in and check out their important disclaimers at masterworks.io backslash disclaimer. And now it's time for tweets of the week. Our first tweet comes from Carter Elliott. Carter says, breaking all 133 Virginia school superintendents call on Governor Youngkin to take down his critical race theory tip line. And that was the tip line that people could use to report teachers and it got spammed by Gen Zers messing with Glenn Youngkin. Good to see a Glenn Youngkin L, love to see it. 
Yeah, and the second tweet of the week comes from the very our very own Rick Wilson, um, who says, quote, remember, the Republican Party of the future isn't DeSantis or Hawley or Cruz. It's Jordan and Green and Gosar and the rest of the mutant parade, the lowest possible denominators. Yeah, we've been saying this for a while. That's the face of the Republican Party. So we go to the polls in November. Yes, sir. Remember who you're voting against. And our final tweet of the week comes from Dan Price. Dan says, Barrel of oil, a week ago, $128, now $99. Gallon of gas, a week ago, $4.17, now $4.32. Oil company profits are at a seven-year high. They get $180 billion a year in government subsidies, and they're in their ensuing $88 billion in buybacks and dividends this year. Do the math. Yeah, a lot of... Of overcharging from companies right now. True. That needs to be called out. So and that was. It's, it's time for lower gas prices. I, I, I'm begging anyway. Yeah, 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 just, I, I, yeah, I know. I just did a long drive. We need it. We need some help. <laughs> With that, that is Tweets of the Week. And that is our show. Thank you so much to the Zoomed In listeners for tuning in and Zooming in every Wednesday, Thursday with us. We appreciate y'all so much. You soon did family. Like I say, every week, and it's true, every week is growing every week, and it's because of y'all. So if you like the show, please share it, tell your friends, tweet at us. And Aaron, the Zoom good listeners want to tweet at us or, you know, maybe comment on one of your TikToks. Where can the people find you? Yeah, uh, on all my social media platforms, at Aaron Parnas, and on my TikTok, at Aaron Parnas with number six. What about you, Jack? You can find me on all platforms at no, well, actually, you can find me on Twitter at JD Cacciarella. That's J D C O C C H I A R E L L A. You can find me on TikTok. You can find me on Instagram. I see some of the Zoomed In listeners follow me on Instagram, and I appreciate that. You can find me on those platforms at Jack D Cacciarella. Thank you to our producers, the Midas Touch Brothers, Jordy, Ben, and Brett Micellas. And thank you to our editor, Adam Sultan, for making this show happen every week. Y'all are the best. Thank you, listeners, again for zooming in with us and we will see you next week.